I'm going to go through this presentation, which is mainly about community heat, but I'll also explain um, the, the work that Avesco does in a little more detail. Um, and we're coming to the end of the first phase of our community heat project. Um, so now we're looking to, um, to move that forward. Anyway, I shall go into that. So um, Barkham, um, a very lovely village in East Sussex. Uh, quite near part of the village, there's three bits to the village really, there's the bigger centre and then there's two smaller um, hubs if you like, uh, one is which, which is near the River Ouse, um, which you can see in this photograph and it's very idyllic and very um, lovely in the spring and summer. Um, oh gosh, right, okay, oh, there we go. Uh, right, so as we know, um, we're all facing this challenge uh, that we need to foster, phase out fossil fuel heating um, in new and existing homes in the next 10 years. Uh, we're in a climate emergency. Um, uh, Barkham, because it's off the gas grid, um, is looking mainly at electric heating uh, and how do we make that affordable? The main problem in these villages which are off the gas grid um, is relying on electric heating it means that this will put real strain onto the electricity grid and the grid therefore becomes constrained. Then the problem lies with the grid operator in our area, UK Power Networks, who, um, who looks after the cabling um, in the southeast of England um, because they have to upgrade the grid. So what, what happens then when you're in an, a situation where you want to um, connect, you, you want to have a heat pump, but actually the grid doesn't have the capacity any longer. Um, and the other thing we were asking as well is how, how does Bokken move to electric cars? Um, because again, that's going to impact the grid and um, constrain it. Uh, we are in under Lewis District Council and they're committed to uh, net zero by 2030. Um, so what exactly is Community Heat? Um, Community Heat is an innovation project um, and we work with UK Power Networks and Borough Happold, a, an engineering company. Um, and the question we asked is, how does a village transition? Do you just let people do whatever they want to do and then deal with the grid as it collapses and UK Power Networks has, has to come along and put it back together again? Or is there a better, more planned approach? And what does that planned approach look like? And what does that planned approach really give you? Is that the best way? I mean, we can all guess that it is, but, um, but what this project set out to do is to prove that. Um, and we're talking about planning, not just for UK Power Networks or just for the villagers, but for everybody. So everybody in this supply chain, um, in this chain, whether it's the installers, UK Power Networks, the villagers, um, yeah, everybody. Um, we're involved, we're a community energy company and I'll come onto that in a little bit. Um, we believe that, um, you know, giving own local ownership um, gives resilience to villages. So this is the team, the dream team, fantastic to work with. Um, there's ourselves, who of course are fantastic to work with. Um, Chris Rowland is the um, CEO of, 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 of ESCO, and he's the senior project manager. Um, I'm the project manager, and Mark Engineer was working for us as operations manager. Uh, Borough Happold, uh, international engineering practice, we're lucky to have Phil Proctor um, working on this project and his team as well, bringing lots of experience. Of course, Barkham Village, the people of the village involved in the project, and then UK Power Networks, the, the, the DNO, District Network Operator, um, and Ashita and her colleague Dean, and um, that the team's widening as we go, go through to the next stage. And this project is funded through the Network Innovation allowance which is a pot of money that UK Power Networks has for innovation projects which ultimately comes from Ofgem. Uh, so this is a Vesco. Uh, we're based in Lewis, lovely little market town in, um, in Sussex uh, and we uh, work there and in the surrounding areas. 
we kind of have three bits to us in a way. We have powering up. We believe that um, renewable uh, energy is the way to go. Obviously, um, you, you do as well, otherwise you wouldn't probably wouldn't be here. Um, the first project was um, a community owned array of PV panels onto the local brewery Harvey's um, in the heady days of the feed in tariff, um, which was hugely successful. Uh, um, Avesco has gone on to put up panels on um, community owned panels on schools, on a local campsite here, on a, a um, a nursery that supplies um, boxes of vegetables to the area and so forth. Um, and at the moment we have um, a big um, 17 megawatt uh, solar farm in for planning as well. So if you fancy that, then please do support it because that would be fantastic. Um, we power down in that we advise people how to save energy um, and we are actually funded to provide um, energy saving advice to people who, who possibly are in fuel poverty, um, but we give advice to anybody who comes to us. Um, and then the third strand is this innovation um, side that, that we're looking to see, you know, how Lewis and the surrounding area can become, um, uh, to, can move away from fossil fuels. Um, we've done lots of work in Barkham. Um, there was a big project in 2009 um, there was a big survey because the, the residents want to come off heating oil. If anyone's on heating oil, you just don't want to be on it. Um, it's dirty, smelly, you have to wait for deliveries. It's pretty horrible. Um, we got 300 homes insulated in 2012. Um, the two sites in the village have community owned PV solar panels. Um, there was a, a heat network assessment on a, a portion of the village in 2015 that was going to be biomass. Um, and there was also, we looked into um, a power from the, the reservoir. Um, and also there's been studies on the river as well. Um, the local um, district council, Lewis District Council, have put a lot of air source heat pumps into their, into their properties in the area. And then in 2020, uh, community heat was launched. So 580 homes, our survey is actually covering about 700 in the parish. 25% um, of homes are pre-1870 and all the problems that that's, that brings. Sorry, I just need to move everybody's pictures over here. Um, uh, the, the village uses 175% above national energy use um, and uh, emits on our, um, uh, on average 18 tonnes of carbon emission um, with a correspondingly high energy bill. And this, this figure is way out of date because it's 2012. Um, so community heat. So what we did was um, we worked um, really directly with the engineering company because what they wanted to do was gather all the information um, that they possibly could uh, of the village and there's something like, and, and they've made this digital twin of the village so they could start to input all this information. And there was something like 10 million bits of information they ended up putting into the, the digital twin software that they, they developed. Um, we surveyed um, 150 houses. Uh, we put in monitoring equipment and we did um, room by room heat loss surveys to see really how much energy those houses used because we know that EPCs uh, are not particularly accurate. They tend to um, overestimate how much energy a house will use, possibly up to 30% um, overestimation. So when the power, when the, the electricity network is looking to, um, to make sure that uh, the, the grid is uh, upgraded, they don't want to upgrade it 30% too much because that will be a waste of everybody's money because what they do ultimately comes back on our bills. We end up paying for it. Um, so um, we all worked hard to, to get all this um, information together. We did the surveys of the houses um, and then um, Borough Happold were able to start to, um, to get information from UK Power Networks to really show all the, um, the electricity grid in the area and all the substations. And then they could start to, um, to to see which scenarios gave what results, whether um, uh, 
if the village um, didn't um, decided not to go with the plan, what would that look like? If the village um, saw that there were lots of different sites around the village where um, they could have community owned generation, um, what that would do to the plan. So this is um, just a still taken from the, um, the, uh, the digital twin software um, and each of the houses have all the information that we could find on them within them. So they show the, um, the, the, the um, what capacity they would need for heating. Um, the digital twin also shows all the sites that were um, researched around the village and all the, the, um, the rooftops to show where PV could possibly go. Um, we found 15 sites where PV could go and only two sites for wind because it's just not a very windy village. Um, so this is just a slide showing um, our, um, our, our, our view of um, the uh, of um, community owned energy really, that we see that it gives long-term community res resilience. It also starts to keep them, tries to, it starts to keep electricity prices low. And all this happened before the current energy crisis. And, and this has only um, increased um, the argument to have locally owned renewable community owned uh, energy. And uh, you know it helps in that transition from fossil fuels to renewable power as well. And community-led energy keeps the money local, which is really important. It keeps it keeps lots of things local. So this is the um, the interesting slide in terms of the results of the the project. So these figures really show this unplanned approach. You know that there's no plan, there's no planning, there's no particular um, plan to to generate um, electricity on site, it all just flows. Each household makes its own decision. It fumbles around in the supply chain, tries to find you know, installers, um, tries to, to make a plan for each house versus this very planned approach that, the ha that each household is quite clear as to the, the path that they should take, that um, uh, the, the local supply chain is involved in all of this because you know, as somebody mentioned, it's, it's just as hard down here to get PV installers, to get your house in, in, insulated, all the heat pump people are all booked up. So the supply chain really needs to expand and needs to, needs to get quite coordinated as well. So when we kind of take all that and, and put it into the plan, we see that there is a 20% energy saving by being planned rather than unplanned a 27% reduction in household overall energy costs. And to be honest, that figure was calculated before the, the kind of the current energy crisis over the last few months. So that's figures probably high end. So yeah, um, and then there's this really interesting figure down here, which is the 75% saving in network reinforcement costs. And, you know, we might ask why it's important that um, UK Pan Network saves money, um, but actually, um, I mentioned earlier that that all the costs of the network eventually come back to us. We we pay something like eighty seven pounds a year on our electricity through our electricity bills um, for these costs. So Ofgem is always very keen um, to um, ensure that UK Power Networks keeps their costs to a minimum while maintaining safety and all the rest of the things that they have to that they have to do. Um, so this is a figure which means that um, at the end of this first part of the project, that there's real, there's legs to this, there's a real um, benefit to having a plan behind, um, behind this transition. Um, so let me just right okay. Um, so uh, so what we're doing at the moment um, is even though the project kind of has kind of formally come to an end, obviously you never stop talking to um, the community that you've, you've been talking to. Um, we're working with a steering group there and they've, they've started to develop some of the sites. They're looking at um, some of the PV sites and also possibly at the river as well to see if, um, if, if there's any um, 
uh, use of, of looking at all the, the work that's already been looked at in terms of um, the hydro generation. Um, so that's really great. We're also um, just about to launch our home energy plan, which is a plan for every village, sorry, every, um, every uh, household in the village to, um, to go on that journey through to um, reducing your carbon footprint, through to um, how to reduce um, um, heat loss in your house by insulating, through to how to generate for your own house PV and solar thermal, and then the stage four low carbon heating, heat pumps, and explaining all, the, all of that. And then obviously, um, that final stage of community ownership to start to bring down the price of electricity and then um, information about grants, not a very large section, and then list of suppliers, that kind of thing. So every house in the village will get one of these plans um, and uh, we'll be kind of launching that over the summer. Um, at the same time, we're applying for funding to, uh, to really extend this project, to look at what happens if if um, we go to clusters of villages, whether this approach actually works on a village which is different from, from Barkham, has a different setup, because this isn't about going into a village and saying, um, here's, here's the PV sites, here's what you do. It's about looking to see every single village, um, every individual village. Uh, and what we're also doing, because we have um, a lot of people locally asking us, uh, if they can start to get involved. We've developed a program called Kickstart, which is um, just a way for a community to start to form an, a community energy plan, to start to question um, um, householders in the village, to send out a questionnaire, to review and list um, the heat and energy suppliers, to look at the idea of housing archetypes and to see what types of housing there is in the village and what you need to do with them. And also the measure, the measure of interest, because it's all very well for one person to be very keen on it, but actually, if your community is not that interested, then um, it's not a community to work with, really. Um, so there, so that's the end of my presentation. Sorry about the rather big gap in the middle, um, but I hope that was of interest. And I'll just stop sharing my screen now. That's great. Thanks very much, Nikki. Um, so I think we'll we'll go straight on to Crispin's presentation. So if you could save your questions for later, we'll put them in the chat if if that's useful. Um, so um, Crispin is an energy community energy consultant working in Fife, who's worked with the Fife Communities Climate Action Network, and also I believe has had quite a lot of involvement in development of, of bike pathways. But um, I'll leave it um, to him to to say more. Okay, hi folks. Um, thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm I'm representing uh, FCAN today, and so um, I'm a director of FCAN uh, along with Jan. Actually, Jan's also a director of Jan Davison, who's with us, is a director of FCAN. So yeah, this is this is a fairly new um, a fairly new project. Well, we've been we've been developing it for a couple of years, but actually, in terms of getting up to a state for um, uh, uh, proper development stage, um, it, we, we've been, well, it's been the last six months, we've really got uh, got going on this. Um, so what's the background? Anyway, well, FCAN, uh, some people might not know about FCAN, so it's Five Communities Climate Action Network. So it's a network of about 30 community organisations in Fife, and all those organisations are working on climate change. So it's not just general organisations, and in fact, Say, uh, TCT and Plant are, are obviously members, um, but other members are like Sustainable Cooper, Transition St Andrews, Greening Kakadi, Rosyth Eats, this sort of thing. Um, so there's 30 of us, and actually coming together and being a collective voice, we have been, uh, as FCAN, have been a lot more effective in lobbying um, various parties, but particularly Five Council. And creating good relationships with Five Council, uh, it's been, uh, you know, I think that side of FCAN has been, has been very, very useful, you know, uh, and also sitting on the Five Environment Partnership has been very useful uh, to actually get to know these people and to put forward 
uh, the community point of view because otherwise what happens is there's a lot of talking going on in these places um, and it's all public sector organizations without any community input. So FCAN's been, a, I think, has been a, a good uh, change agent um, over the last several years. So our understanding, how we came to this project, was that um, member organisations and their members were interested in renewable energy, and that's clear from what we're seeing tonight as well. Uh, but coupled with that, landowners were seeking quite often to uh, think about renewable energy, think about their climate uh, impact, think about what they could do, and also, let's be honest, if they're private landowners um, or even commercial landowners, they're thinking about the opportunities for renewables. And so it seemed like a, a good time to uh, start thinking about this. And what we, we, we were inspired in part by other organisations like the Edinburgh Community Solar Co-op um, and various other uh, community sector renewables organisations. Um, so that was that's really where we came from. So we created a project, been thinking about it for a couple of years. We really created it uh, and created its, its firm foundations uh, probably uh, 18 months ago. And this is what, can folks see this, the project aims? So we've got a number of aims. It's, it's, quite, it's quite broad. So we wanted to have um, community education. So we think renewables are vehicles for quite a few of these things. So community education, um, visibility. So actually, if we have renewables in people's settings, then they realize they aren't something that's a long way away. It's something that we can actually have here and be part of. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a community wealth building agenda. So it's about community empowerment, really, um, and, and allowing communities to be part of uh, the story of what's happened. And I think, you know, the, the opening um, the opening video of uh, that Kashka showed of the you know the aspirations or a story that could it's told you know that's a that's a great example and uh, a very colourful one as well. Um, Bacon and Derry land was was a, another aspect we came across and actually that's not what we started out thinking about, but I th we thought if we're going to deal with urban and peri-urban sites, then actually those sites are typically going to be uh, vacant and derelict land sites because. Uh, Trying to do, for example, a whole project that was on rooftop solar is immensely complicated. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of problems, uh, to be honest. So we were looking at a smaller number of sites uh, that actually we have a larger amount of panels uh, in, the, in the case of PV. So our relations with uh, Fife Council um, really brought bore fruit because they, they came back to us and said, well, have you thought about all these sites that are on the vacant and derelict land register because actually we'd really like something to happen to these sites there's a lot of uh post-industrial sites and indeed post-mining sites uh that have sat in fife for at least two decades some of them much longer and um i mean surprisingly in towns as well you know in, in quite central parts of towns they're sitting there for 20 years doing nothing and so they want to get some some action on these. And so we said, right, OK, well, that's that sounds like uh, something we could really work with. We just need to look at the individual sites um, and and look at uh, our consumption partners, where they would be in in, con in the context of the locations of the production sites and uh, take take it uh, from there. Then. One of the key aims was community benefits. So we really wanted to see that um, the community had some control of what came out of these. So obviously there's electricity going to come out, what else is going to come out? And the commercial sector very often is not very good. In fact, Fife Council hasn't been great about its uh, renewable assets, about uh, having community benefits. So we really wanted to have some community benefits um, that were in control of the, of the community sector. Financial sustainability was a, another um, for community organizations was another uh, key benefit because we recognize that actually a lot of small community organizations that are perhaps less successful than Tayport Community Trust in fundraising really struggle with that long-term funding. You know, they can get some funding for a project, but actually, you know, paying the insurance, paying the accountants, you know, paying higher fees for halls or subsidizing a hall, you know, it's, it's really difficult. So actually we thought, Community energy projects because they're long-term, 20, 25 years. These are these are good, and they don't 
necessarily provide huge amounts of money, but actually for most communities, um, having 10, 10 grand a year to uh, run a community organization is gonna be extremely useful. Uh, and knowing that that's going to be guaranteed as well, that sort of finance um, coming in. Renewable energy generation, of course, we want more of that. Um, green energy consumption, so helping um, households switch to away from um, fossil fuels. I mean, what's interesting, if we're looking at, um, I mean, the, we, we didn't see it in, in Nikki's presentation, but actually looking at uh, the UK's average, you know, um, we can switch to, to green electricity, but actually we're using probably three, most houses are using three times as much energy in terms of kilowatt hours um, to heat their houses than, than they are in just uh, ordinary uh, electricity. So most, most houses are using three times as much gas in terms of energy value than they are electricity. So that's, that's quite a big one. Um, and um, I think the, what Nikki's talking about in terms of um, district heating and, uh, and indeed uh, heat pumps is, is very pertinent there. And we really saw the project finally as, 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 a, as a change agent. We thought it, it could really um, help change people's attitudes. And actually, we're difficult to reach communities that are not normally interested in this sort of stuff. Um, so that's, that's what the project's really trying to do. So what's the mechanism? Um, the mechanism is to um, create a portfolio of, of project sites where we build, own and operate uh, the, uh, the renewable energy facilities. And then we sell the power direct to uh, commercial and industrial customers uh, via a private wire. So not via the grid. Once you sell it to the grid or once you put it into the grid, even if it's going to be transported 500 meters away, then you encounter very heavy costs. So there's actually little difference in the costs if you're transporting the electricity 500 meters or 500 kilometers to London or wherever, you know. Um, so the grid's expensive. So actually uh, for short distances, um, it makes it worthwhile putting a private wire in. And then you, then you can basically split the difference between what is a, um, a production, a production uh, sales cost of something like, say, 9p a kilowatt hour and uh, something that they're buying. So commercial customer is probably, well, they're buying considerably less than retail rates, but they're still probably paying something like 20p a kilowatt hour now. Um, and so you can meet in the middle um, a, a lot more and, and both, both have uh, economic advantages. So I, the, the picture I've shown there is, um, is, is a very dry, very dry country that probably isn't Scotland, but actually I've chosen it because it probably gives you an idea of what the sorts of size of the, the these PV projects that we're doing, it's they're not they're not huge in terms of each site. They're going to be at well, I think the biggest is two hectares actually, um, and they're not going to be completely green because they're going to be brownfield sites uh, at the moment. Uh, you know, a lot of these sites are literally brown. They don't have very much uh, because you know they're post-industrial and actually some of them post-mining and um, probably contaminated as well some of them um, so that's that's the plan be, build own operate and then sell via private wire um, so how do we finance this uh, well we finance it via a community share offer um, and in this mechanism uh, we prioritize the people that live closest to those facilities and so um, it's likely that uh, these well typically these these share offers are oversubscribed and so basically the people that are closest, um, you know, get get the shares. Uh, and if there isn't enough money locally, then it moves out until there is enough money. Um, and typically what's been happening is, uh, although this doesn't take into account our inflationary era, but in the last 20 years, typically what's been happening is there's been interest bearing shares. Um, and it's been something like for the, the financial models are something like four and a half percent, which has been quite nice, actually, until until the inflation kicked in in the last year or so. Um, the model that we're using or proposing to use is uh, the energy for all model. And some of you might know, some of you might have invested in these, um, in these projects. Uh, there's, there's been um, more than 25 and one of them's Edinburgh, that's probably our most local, well, nearly our most local one is uh, um, uh, Edinburgh Community Solar Corp, which has had two rounds of funding. Uh, in Edinburgh Community Solar Corp uh, was, a, was in partnership with Edinburgh Council and what they did was put 
um, PV panels on 25 schools and community buildings in Edinburgh. And then there's a contract um, for the Edinburgh City Council to buy the power, all the power that is generated. Um, and what they didn't buy then got sold to the grid, but actually you don't make any money selling to the grid. Um, so uh, that's, that, that's how that worked. Uh, there's, there's one in Fife actually at Rumbling Bridge, a hydro project, a, a small run of river, river hydro project. And just over the water uh, and up river from yourselves, uh, there is gonna be um, the Dundee, I think they call it Dundee Renewable Energy. Anyway, it's, in, it's, it's at a field in Invergarry at the old SCRI, at the James Hutton. And so that's actually um, in process. I think it's been funded already and they're, and they're just about uh, constructing it. So this, this energy for all model, it's a well-proven model. They know what they're doing. They've got all the bits and pieces to make it all work, whether that's the financing, the, the um, you know, financial conduct authority permissions, the contractors lined up, all the, you know, the share offer mechanism for it all to work. So it's a good, it's a good system and I'm, you know, it's well-proven. I'm very confident that, um, if we did want to use them and, and not go alone, then uh, that would be a, a very good way to go. So what are the community benefits? Well, um, you know, there's a, there is a local investment opportunity, um, which is clearly there. And, you know, most of us have got, um, particularly, uh, you know, those that are middle-aged onwards, we've got, we've, we, we're saving for pensions. And um, actually, if we scrutinize our pensions, it'll be rather a nasty experience because uh, many of them are invested investing in things that uh, we really wouldn't like, um, like coal mining uh, and um, other uh, unpleasant uh, ventures. So I think having an, an ethical and local investment is actually is, is part of uh, addressing climate change. That's not the principal reason for this though. I mean, really the focus is on community benefits and services. Um, and uh, as I said before, we want to focus on climate related benefits. So some of these uh, community energy projects actually, they're about community energy, but then they just hand over a wadge of cash to the local community to do with what they want. But actually we want to make the money work twice. So that invested money, we want to build community renewable energy, and then the profits that are coming out of it to the community, we want to make that work for climate change again. Um, and so we're really we're really focused on this. And so one of the things we've come up with is is EV charging facilities for social housing residents. And, you know, some of you may be aware um, just by looking around you that around 50 percent of uh, residential houses in Scotland don't have off street parking. And for those people, um, having EV charging is going to be is going to be really tricky uh, until, you know, the councils actually and particularly five councillors, unfortunately, um, has has some real barriers about having on street park on street parking and charging, uh, which again FCAM is working on uh, trying to find a resolution for. Um, but we think there is there's opportunities for uh, actually hiring people as as the council hire um, garages to social housing residents. You know why don't we why don't we hire a build as part of a project, build a fleet of garages and actually have charge points in in them and actually hire them to people who have electric cars um, and you know it's it's a mechanism it's a, it's another part of the business but actually that's really facilitating people that wouldn't be able to have an electric car to actually get one and make that transition so we've, we've got this model um, of a conceptual model of an urban renewable project and I don't know whether folk can how is that legible at all yeah you can see it thank you Colin um, so basically the blue, the blue parts are the, um, the electricity generation and, and operations. And then it's going down into the green boxes, which are what we're gonna do with the electricity. So there may be some grid import and export, there might be some grid services. So actually it's complicated, but actually if you're good at it, providing services for the grid um, in terms of short, short term energy and um, managing frequencies and this sort of thing can be actually very profitable. Um, I don't think that's going to be the core of what we're doing, but it's certainly it's certainly possible. Then we're looking at um, local microgrids, so we might be uh, looking at a campus or a private wire, typically private wire to um, a consumer. So, for example, what sort of 
what sort of organizations are we talking about? Well, there's uh, one of the sites we're looking at is at um, just across the railway from um, Forvo Nairn, and we're looking at uh, putting a, a wire under the railway on, through a duct that actually still exists from uh, when they own both sides of the site and helping them to um, reduce their uh, their climate impact by supplying renewable energy. Um, so that's that's the sort of thing that could happen. We're also looking at uh, with NHS Fife some of their sites, including uh, St Margaret's in Dunfermline, putting a uh, a PV site um, on some vacant and derelict land that they actually own, um, and is on a slope and it's just got some scrub. I mean, it looks like it was a landfill site of some sort or from when they built the hospital, to be honest, it's it's all a bit of a mess. Um, and so put some PV panels there. There's about a hectare, just over a hectare and run a wire up to where their um, power comes in. And so that would be wired in before the meter. So behind the meter, so not on the grid side. And so, uh, you know, in that way, we can actually create climate impacts and benefits for those local businesses and um, facilities. Then we're looking at public EV charging. Well, you could do that with, we could actually just supply some public EV charging, supplement the, the existing network that Fife has. And actually, just as an aside, Fife has a pretty low charge point rate per capita. It's pretty poor, actually. Um, another thing that FCAN is lobbying uh, Fife about. But I think the, the, the novel idea is really about creating, dedicating hireable, rentable ch parking spaces uh, that we can actually provide to people that are um, that don't have off-street parking. And that would include social, social housing tenants. Um, and so we think that, you know, one of the outcomes of that is we are helping to tackle disadvantage. And that is a real community benefit as well. So that's our kind of conceptual model for thinking about how, how things will work. Um, so where we've been looking, so this is kind of, this map is um, a GIS map of where we've been looking at a long list, and you'll see there's one up by, by Tayport. So on the vacant and derelict land register, the old RAF site uh, along near Tensmuir is, is there, but I'm not sure, it, it's not something we've included in, in a study or anything. Um, I understand from local, local people that uh, it's a very valued site for uh, the kids to go and have uh, parties and not disturb, not disturb local people. Uh, so I understand from uh, various middle-aged folk that had that experience when they were teenagers. So that, that was our long list. Um, <clears throat> and then we made a short list, which I'll show you the sites. But basically we, want, we wanted to go to a phase one. We, we see this as a phase-wise project. You know, if we're successful in phase one, then there will be another phase as there has been in Edinburgh Community Solar and as there has been in other projects. You know, Fife's a big place, there's actually quite a lot to do. And we need to do it in bite-sized chunks, you know, chunks that are handleable. And so what we've looked, we've said, okay, let's let's do a feasibility study. What are the, the best sites, our most likely sites in this? And we've um, selected uh, 11, 11 PV sites, totaling about 12 hectares. A lot of those, although not all of them, are on vacant and derelict land in, in an urban or peri-urban situation. Um, and there's one there's one site that we uh, are speaking to uh, an agricultural landowner about um, about one or two turbines, uh, and that's that's really just because of its proximity to um, Strathedon Hospital. Um, and so, if I if I show you now, there, here's here's a here's a map of the sites that we're actually taking to. Um, taking to this phase one feasibility study, which is just starting now. So they're spread, they're spread across um, central southern Fife from basically from, from Cooper through to Dunfermline. Here's an example of uh, the one I was talking about earlier. So we can see there's a couple of sites here. This is Nairn Street, um, Nairn Street in Kakodi. Some folk might be familiar with it. So on the north side of the railway, <clears throat> we've got a, um, we've got the, the Forbo Nen factory. On the south side of the railway, where you can see the, the lower hatch box, that was also Forbo Nen factory that um, has been uh, vacant and derelict uh, literally for 20 years. And so um, we're looking at uh, putting PV panels on that 1.2 hectares and then taking the power back under the under the uh, under the railway to to Forbo Nairn. 
Uh, there's another one uh, up on the just to the right there, which is um, it's a scrapyard, which is kind of um, a pretty bad neighbour to the uh, to the folk that live in the area. So um, that's being that's being taken over by Fife Council, uh, and they're keen to see um, keen to see that actually it's, it has a functional use, um, and they see that PB on this would be good as well. So that's that's 0 0.6 of a hectare. So together it's 1.8 hectares. So there's probably 1.8 hectares. I mean, rule of thumb, um, that would probably give us nearly a megawatt of um, peak output, which isn't an, an insignificant amount uh, of power. So those are some examples of, of the sites we're looking at. So um, what are we doing in the phase one feasibility study? Well, um, we're doing a lot of liaison and have been doing a lot of liaison. We need to continue it with sites and partners. There's a technical feasibility study which will be done by a consultant. So that would be the CARES consultant that actually does that. We don't know who that's going to be, but actually it'd be an engineering consultant, you know, like Borough Happold or one of the other big international consultancies. There's a lot of permissions and planning stuff to consider what we need. Um, then there's legal stuff, which is mainly about focused around um, land ownership, um, but also uh, what sort of legal agreements we're going to have. So really there's going to be two legal agreements. There's one that's going to be a... Um, you know, a landowner and a tenant in terms of renting renting a, a land or use of a land for 20 years. And then there's going to be a power purchase agreement legal side of it uh, where we're selling and we have a long term um, uh, arrangement with the power purchasers. A lot of community engagement work. And, you know, actually, this is this is kicking it off, going out to uh, FCAN members and talking to talking to uh, them about what we're trying to do. Communications, obviously, we're going to we've, we've got a. FCAN has a has a website which is a pretty crappy website um, because it's it's been a home built thing that we haven't had funding to do. But actually, as part of this project, uh, we're going to get a decent uh, project website and and branding and that sort of thing. And then of course there's there's managing the whole thing, um, the project management, which is currently what I do uh, for FCAN. And so we got some funding from um, some in kind funding from Cares, and we've got some cash funding from the Vacant and Derelict Land Fund uh, from Fife Council, which is actually Scottish government funding. Um, to try and do something with all these vacant and dairy land sites. And so we're hoping that uh, by autumn this year, we're going to have some reports and we know then what to do. And then, then the next stage would be once we've thinned down the sites, presumably not all these sites are going to be feasible. We're going to have a slightly smaller set of sites. And then, but that's going to be a coherent set of sites that we hope we're going to be able to say, okay, now's the time to create a community benefit society and launch uh, a share offer and actually start doing this stuff. So that's that's about um, about where we're at. So I think um, we're certainly a fair bit behind where Nikki and her project are, but hopefully uh, that gives you a picture of what we're trying to do and and uh, when we should be doing it. Thanks so much, Kristen. That was great. Um, I might turn my camera off just because of my internet. Yeah. That's fine. It Thank doesn't you. crash again. I can see quite a few um, faces popping up, so we could we could make a gradual start on the questions, I think, and then others can obviously join us. We'll try and pick up any questions from the chat as we go along. But otherwise, I wonder if I could ask you to use the reactions and put your hand up. I know it feels a bit like being back at school, but if you click on reactions at the bottom, there's a place to put your hand up and then that makes it a bit easier for the chair to kind of organize the sequence of questions and try and make sure everyone gets to ask their question. Um, one that I noticed in the chat from earlier from Caroline was how a community makes a decision on this. Um, so I wondered, if I, could, I wondered if I could put that together with a related question of my own, um, which is what, initiative the community needs to take in order to involve itself because it strikes me that both speakers are involved in organizations which have a fairly well developed process um, and perhaps particularly in relation to the, the structure that Crispin has described um, you're obviously taking a lot of initiatives what what initiatives would we need to take in order to increase our chances of being involved, put it that way. And, and then 
as Caroline said, how would that be decided? Is, is that to me, Andrew? Uh, yes, well, to both, but perhaps you, right. particularly in some ways. Um, well, I, th I think there's, there's certainly scope for, um, for community organisations and in particular FCAN members to feed into this process. Uh, you know, we, we have tried to publicise it, well, we have publicised this through, you know, to members. Um, I think <clears throat> in this first phase, basically, um, our relations with Fife Council and the mutual benefits of trying to deal with vacant and derelict land, including funding, um, meant that actually it steered the project slightly and we're focusing on that in the first phase. But what I would see is that actually, if we're successful in this, then I would see that there is definitely scope for um, more localized uh, approaches in partnership with FCAN members like TCT. And indeed, you know, why shouldn't something happen? Why shouldn't a, a, a Tayport uh, renewable energy scheme be part of a future Fife Renewables, you know, Fife wide go in a basket? Because certainly the, the fixed costs of doing all the financial stuff um, greatly benefit from economies of scale. And um, so I think, you know, if you're a really organized community, I'm sure you could do it on your own, but actually it'd be a lot to get better and easier for four or five or six communities like Tayport that are keen on doing stuff to actually do it together. Um, I think it'd be much e it'd be much easier, and and the likelihood of success would be much greater. So there would be an advantage in finding a group of other communities to work with. Yes, and I, th I think that's going to happen though. As this project moves forward and we get and you know in general people become more interested uh in in these issues and in climate issues but also in the economic benefits i mean the, the the real the real game changer i think for our sector would be if this local electricity bill gets through and in fact i, I hope people have been aware of that it's um it's facts we've been asking wendy chamberlain uh the MP to actually use it. She, she's got an opportunity for a, a ballot bill, um, which basically means a private member's bill that's quite likely to get read. Uh, and uh, we've been lobbying for the local electricity bill uh, to be to be uh, for her to put that forward. And what that would mean is that actually, if the local electricity bill was passed as it's drafted, one of the key things it's trying to do is to remove the regulatory barriers that prevent generators local generators selling direct to local customers so residential customers so at the moment you can't do that so if you've got a, if you put up a wind turbine or you've got a lovely pv site right by tayport you can't sell it to the people in tayport unless you go via one of the big energy suppliers via the grid and then basically you know there isn't any energy saving because the because the overheads of the grid there isn't any any uh, sorry there isn't any financial saving there's no financial saving at all it comes out about the same um and so uh you know our thinking is and i think i think it's common is that you know if you particularly with wind turbines if you're if you've got the um you know as what some people would see as the aesthetic disbenefit of having a wind turbine in your backyard one of the benefits you should be able to get is getting some cheap power from it you can't do that now. And actually, it's just regulatory bullshit that is stopping us doing that. And so, you know, there's been a campaign for a long time to actually do something about that. And the electricity bill uh, has local electricity bill is trying to trying to do that. So, um, yeah, that would that would be a game changer, I think, for community renewables as well. Great. Thank you. So um, I, perhaps I'll ask Nikki if she could come in because it might be interesting to sort of compare the situation there in terms of community initiatives and community decision making. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I mean, it's interesting because Lewis has a, a long history, long recent history of um, of engagement, really. So, um, you know, Avesco was formed in 2007. So we've we have, you know, a real um, 
a decade and a half of experience and also um, expectation of community engagement. Um, there's lots of other um, groups in, in Lewis and the surrounding areas. Um, Transition Town was one of the, um, Lewis was one of the early, early adopters of that model. Um, and actually Avesco came out of um, a Transition Town initiative. Uh, and I would say that, you know, people of the town, not everybody, but there is a real, um, a real wish to tackle climate change. It's quite a large Extinction Rebellion group, um, which formed a climate hub. So, so in a way, it's quite, um, it hasn't, it hasn't been, it's not hard at the moment to engage with certain, certainly certain sections of the, the population in, in Lewis. Um, and we don't have problems raising um, uh, funds when we, when we go to that group of people, to the group of people we go to when, when we, we have a new offering to them. Um, I completely agree with, um, with Crispin, who's talking about the local energy bill, that um, you know, if we can offer the energy that is being generated by a local scheme to the local people, that would just be a game changer, absolutely transformational. Um, and you know, let's hope that happens at some stage. Thank you. There was also a question for you, Nikki, in the chat from Jim Proctor. It was to do with the digital twin, the digital modelling of Barkum. He was asking whether... Oh, the OK. Unfortunately, when I came back in, it wiped all the questions yeah. off. <laughs> are, are there open digital twin platforms that could be used by communities to explore their own options? Absolutely no idea, I'm afraid. No. Um, I mean, d digital twin technology, I believe, is reasonably new. Um, it hasn't been around for that long. Whether there's open source, I would have absolutely no idea. Right, yeah, it'd be an interesting thing to research. Hi, Jim. So, so I think you yeah. have another question to ask. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it was actually more of um, the, the cost, obviously, is building the, trims, the twin software, but then actually the real cost is putting the information into a twin. Yeah. And... This seems to be something that you can distribute by having communities do this. Mm. Um, so, I mean, you've done very well in putting together this, this approach to funding a project to produce some, a roadmap, but it seems like you could roll this out yep. multiply. Yes, <laughs> so uh, there's, yes there's absolutely. And, and that's what our next level of funding will be looking at. Um, mm. you know, obviously, Barkham was, was um, we went into real detail on Barkham, but it's how you scale that up that's um, uh, achievable for communities. And that's what we'll be looking at, because obviously mm. that initial project cost a lot of money. And, you know, it, that's just not economic. And also it takes so much time. So how can we do this quickly and accessibly? And so that's what, and at scale, and also put some innovation into um, the electricity grid and how people are accessing electricity. So all that, you know, we're, we're hoping will happen in the next in the next stage. Um, so I, to be honest, it, it's I, I'm not exactly clear whether we'll be producing digital twins for every single community or whether oh, that, is, that's what I'm getting at. You, you wouldn't know, be producing them. the communities no. will be producing their digital twins. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's uh, the point. You, you have to flip it. Yeah. Yeah. Really. I can see that Simon Little has a question. Yeah. So um for Nikki and um Crispin, uh, where do you think the maximum in Impact can be had for the greatest number of people in the shortest possible time. <laughs> um, I mean, I would say, um, you know, a PV probably rooftop PV is is you know achievable for quite a lot of people and relatively quick. You're not running into planning um, issues, um, you know, because ground mounted PV, we're in the national park here. So that's just a bit of a nightmare for planning. Um, even if we're just outside the national park, we've still run into planning problems. So yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, um, a bulk buying scheme, 
um, that uh, you know your community can get behind. It's quite a, quite a simple project, really, um, and to go to go for that. What, what do you reckon, Crispin? Do you think that's a, a, a good way forward? Well, I, th I think certain, certainly um, renewables of our own are, are a great thing. But several years ago, well, back in back in 2014, I um, I looked at this and I was I was going to I embarked on getting some uh, PV panels on the roof. Um, and I was speaking to a consultant. We had a you know had a quotation and uh, and thought about it carefully. But actually, um, when I looked at the numbers in terms of the cost benefits, so the costs in terms of money and the benefits in terms of carbon impact, um, it, it quickly became extremely clear that the the, the a massively greater impact um, could be gained by simply not driving a diesel car and driving an electric car. I mean, it's it's really massive. I mean, overnight, basically, um, I was able to reduce the household CO2 output by three and a half tons a year, which is a kind of a, a fairly major impact. It's nearly nearly 50% of the household um, impact in our particular case. So I think, um, so I, I'm, I'm a big, I've had electric cars since 2014 um, and, you know, and charged with, Actually, I buy the green electricity. Um, I think PV panels, if you are if you're at home during the day and if you've got a car at home during the day to charge it, then yes, PV panels then are a great idea. If you're out at work and there's nobody at home, um, it really calls into question, well, what, do you, what are you going to do with the power? And if you're just going to put it in the grid, well, you know, that's very altruistic of you, but actually you could probably do spend your money better somewhere else. Um, and you could store it in batteries, but then, you know, they've got an environmental overhead as well. Um, and so I'm not sure, you know, if you're going to start buying batteries, well, again, do it in a car um, because it's going to have a much bigger impact. So uh, that's that's my opinion on it. I mean, our big our big uh, our big energy consumptions as a household is our transport and also heat. So um, if you can do something about heat uh, using renewables, then that's the other big win. And uh, the simple thing, the most cost-effective thing that we can all do is to stop heating uh, our hot water by gas and heat it with solar thermal or heat it with, um, with solar PV. And uh, that, that can make a, a huge, huge difference. Very, actually, very cost-effective difference. Uh, you know, without having to go to, uh, to air source or ground source heat pumps, which, are great and certainly if you're not on the gas grid then um, you know probably make a lot of economic sense as well but if you're on mains gas the economic case and the payback is is really is pretty hard and I, my feeling is there's other things we can do as I've talked about uh, before before that. And also, um, I, I like Mike's comment about retrofitting as well. Um, I guess you know I was coming from pre um, reducing carbon you know by you know by putting it into the grid but you know if we're looking at uh, our own houses then yes I mean retrofitting um, can be complicated but you know loft insulation double glazing Absolutely. yeah insulate insulate foot before you start insulation yeah. before you start putting pv panels on absolutely yeah really there's a question from Colin Anderson in the chat I don't know if um Chris and Nikki can you see that uh, yes, uh, I don't know the answer, I'm afraid. I'm not that technical. So, Padler, where would all the practices? Well, it's basically whether that, that you is... need to do a new grid for your distribution mm -hmm. if you're allowed to uh, supply the local um, well, customers. Well, I think I think what we, what you'd be looking at is a um, is a system where you could actually have a derogation and not experience grid connection charges or grid grid usage charges if you were within a certain distance, a certain geographical distance of one or two kilometers, then you know you have then then you say, okay, we'll waive the the, the grid charges. That's the sort of thing we're looking at. I mean you could you could create a, a separate grid. It depends. So for example, for a block of flats, it's probably worth it. For a number of individual houses, it, it's it's probably less worth it. Um, and you know, once you've got on a, a grid there, then uh, why not use it? But actually, it's about the grid charges and and the fact that you're not requiring the massive infrastructure 
which is transporting power long distances. And, and that power that's transported long distances actually has appreciable losses of, you know, something like 10% of the power that's produced is, is, is actually lost to the atmosphere as low grade heat. Um, and so, you know, that's gotta be paid for somewhere. Um, if we're doing very local uh, movements on the grid of a, a couple of kilometers, you don't have any of that. You're not going through transformers. It's just going out as, as you know, as regular 240 volts, just going locally. So I think that that's that's my best answer to that um, as answer, uh, question of Collins. I can see Tony Gowland has a question. Yeah, in general, regardless of whether it's community energy or, um, or, or, or not, renewable energy has got a major impact on the grid because the grid was designed for major um, for major power stations at uh, Long Gannett, um, on the Trent and places like that, where there's coal and, and things. Um, so there's, there's going to have to be a, a major restructuring of, of, the, of the national grid. As part of that, I mean, to, you know, to sort of get the community energy, surely one thing to explore, I mean, it's something probably outside the scope of, of us, but is to have community microgrids. So if you had a gateway from your community network into the national grid, then that could be a private community grid that you can you could work on within the community and any excess or any deficit goes in and in and out of the grid so we could be selling electricity electric in Newport for example if they were a bit short and we have plenty um across the grid but you know I mean that, that's to certain I think I certainly remember I, I, I can't remember where it was I I certainly recall that somewhere in Devon probably not a million miles from Totnes and um, we, we, we're exploring a, a community microgrid so that they could distribute their um, their own power. I think um, I think microgrids are definitely on the agenda, and people are talking about it. And indeed, um, in some commercial situations, um, they're already being experienced. So, for example, down at down at Metal Docks, um, there is a microgrid of on the campus. There, there's seven uh, commercial buildings that include uh, the the docks of surgery, the primary school and then some office buildings basically and and the football club and so that is a microgrid that is powered by um, uh, a wind turbine and some roof and ground mounted pv uh, and it used to have actually uh, hydrogen uh, generation hydrogen storage and, and uh, fuel cells to power it when the sun wasn't shining and the wind wasn't blowing which isn't very often in, in methyl, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think, so that was set up, as far as I understand it, that was a part, as part of the Levermouth project, that was set up, the microgrid side of it was set up by Toshiba and managed. Apparently microgrids are quite complicated to manage. So I think there's some learning to do with that. Um, but I think historically, uh, I mean, Simon made a point about the historically local electricity companies um, uh, there were those and and but i think what we need to think about is historically you know the whole grid was basically designed by a government department um and it was you know a, a fairly simple system that had very large generators that would as uh, we've observed you know mainly coal some of them nuclear so they're point large point generators and they need to distribute the thing around the electricity around um it wasn't really designed for what we're trying to do for it now and um if we look at the change from heating with gas to heating with electricity and the change from fossil fuel cars to electric cars, then actually the grid's going to have to do an awful lot more work and it's going to have to be managed. And of course, there's going to have to be a lot smarter, but actually um, there's, there's going to be, I think there's going to be a huge scope for local generation because I don't, I don't know what it's like up at Taper. I haven't looked at it at Taper, but certainly in the Cooper area in between Cooper and up to Newborough and North, there's there's massive grid constraints already. The grid's at capacity. That's why there's no wind farms there, because actually they could put the wind farms, but they can't do anything with the electricity. They can't get it out and use it unless they're going to use it themselves on their on their own farms for things like, for example, refrigeration, um, large scale refrigeration for agricultural crops or something like that. But so you know, I think um, there are changes that are going to come to the grid, um, and uh, and 
there's lots of smart people that are working on this at the moment, but just what the solution's going to be um, is, is, is not clear at the moment, but certainly it's going to be smarter management of what we got and, and also using, using assets like, um, uh, you know, electric car batteries uh, in reverse to actually power the grid during peak periods as well, and that sort of thing. Yes, it was interesting that Avesco are working with the network providers. Is that something that, that, that your group gets involved in, Crispin, negotiating with the network providers? Uh, no, it, it isn't, because um, it's not a conversation we've had, to be honest. I, I think the thing is, we, we decided to go down a route, a, a private wire route. Um, uh, it's not a, yeah, it's not a conversation. I know from, uh, previous experience with uh, renewable generators that Scottish Power, which is our local network company, doesn't have a fantastic reputation with renewable generators about getting grid connections and, um, or even, I mean, not, not just at reasonable cost, but actually any grid connections. Um, and it's, uh, and to a certain extent, it's about corporate attitude because certainly the uh, Scottish and Southern who are the old hydro board are an awful lot better. So it's not something we thought about, to be honest. Um, we've, we thought, okay, can we do this with the private wires? Um, and if we can do it with private wires, then it's just a, an, another whole load of negotiation that we're, we're cutting out uh, and, and also costs. So we haven't, but I think, um, I don't know what the situation with UK power networks is, uh, but I think a lot of grid operators are seriously thinking about, okay, what's the most economic thing for us to do here? Is, is it actually to build more capacity or is it to help to get partner with people and organizations that want to help manage capacity so that we don't have to spend so much capital budget on building new capacity? So I would imagine that's, you know, it's an economic decision why they're doing it. Um, and if that makes sense, well, that's great. I mean, that's working to everyone's benefit and working for climate uh, mitigation as well. Thank you. Yeah. Would, would anyone else like to come in with a question or a comment? Maybe Nikki's got an idea of, of an, a sense of, of what um, UK power networks, you know, what their motivations are for working with Avesco. Um, well, I think there's um, uh, well, all the, the DNOs, um, as I understand it, um, have got a new model that they're working towards of DSOs, which is exactly what Crispin is saying, that they're having to manage. Um, sorry, can I just shut, shut the door a second? Hold on a second. One dog, out. Sorry, the dog's wanting to uh, play ball. Um, uh, the, the, the DNO's function is changing to... Um, that in the past, if they were just a, you know, it was a linear relationship from national grid, that their relationship is changing to deal with um, this multiple inputs of renewables locally um, and having to deal with the grid at, at that level. Um, I think the UK Power Networks has, has embraced that, to be honest. You know, their five year plan really embraces, um, but they're also being pushed by Ofgem to develop the, the DSO side of things. Uh, and to work out how to do that. Uh, we're certainly not looking at kind of private grids uh, at all, because we see that, A, we're working with UK Power Networks, and that's that's the way that that project is, is going, but also that the network is there. So, so why take on responsibility of something which is actually really difficult to look after and very expensive to look after when, when there's... A, a company that is completely set up to deal with that safely. Whereas Crispin, you're working on projects, which is, is kind of different, it's quite different from our project, isn't it's it? Different. Because we're looking, we're looking with the DNO at that future planning to allow the capacity, which you, you know, you're, you're constrained in your area and that's exactly what we're looking at, albeit at a, a village level rather than a kind of possibly a more industrial level. We have constraints all around here for, for larger PV farms and, um, you know, not particularly wind farms in this area, but, you know, we deal with exactly the same problems. We deal with, you know, um, somebody who wants, say, a large um, air source heat pump and they have to pay for three grade upgrade. 
a three phase upgrade at you know cost of 25 grand you know this kind of thing it's all it's all going on down here yeah i think so that, that's that's absolutely right so i think you, you've got a residential project and we've actually got a commercial industrial project which so they're, they're different sorts of projects but um well it's, it's very interesting to hear here i mean i think this the history of it is that um my sense of it is that uh Scottish power and, and the like, a lot, a lot of them historically have not wanted, they haven't wanted the aggravation of having lots of little power generators at the end of their lines and having to manage all that power. It's much more complicated. Actually, it probably gets less complicated as it becomes automated, you know, with computing. Um, but historically, it, they just haven't wanted it. It's, it's not been very much money. It's been much more aggravation than it's worth. So basically, for the last well until the last i think probably the last five or ten years but before that they basically made it hard for it to happen mm -hmm. and uh, because it's just been a pain for them and so they've been um they've been relatively uncooperative uh, and they've only done what they've had to do um but you know i think they, they must see that the writing's on the wall they've got to change now and um you know, and and the, the the demands on the local electricity network are going to get so much greater. Then they've got to think about okay, what's the most economic solution? And actually, working working with communities uh, has got to be part of it. Yeah. So um, so the uh, the DNOs have uh, five year plans, and the next one comes in next April. So it could be worth looking at your local DNOs five year plan to see mm. what's in there. UK Power Networks includes the Community Heat Project and they're committed to working with taking 71% of off gas grid communities kind of working to take them off, off um, oil and onto electric heating. So, you know, for UK Power Networks, I think they're quite forward looking, but that is written into their plan. But I, I'm also understanding this pressure from Ofgem to, you know, to push them in that direction. That's the way it's going. So they've got to, they've got to kind of to go that way. It strikes me that Tayport's in an interesting sort of middle situation because it's it's mostly residential, but it does have some brownfield sites. It's a bit post-industrial as well. Well, but my advice to to Tayport, if it's interested in taking this forward, is to begin conversations with the industrial sites and the industrial users. Begin a conversation about it. And ask them about you know about cooperating about community renewables um certainly you know there'd be benefits for them i mean nobody nobody's going to be making a loss out of these projects uh, if they go right there's some risk involved in them there's definitely early stage there's risk uh, but once they're up and running then there's not very much risk but actually you know everybody can benefit from it thank you so it's it's 8 42 i'm I'm aware that we've taken up quite a lot of our speakers' evenings out of the goodness of their hearts. So although I'm very happy to go on talking because it's fascinating, um, I feel perhaps um, we should let, let the speakers go if they'd like to, if they have dogs or families or food to, to deal with. Um, uh, but if there, any, if there are any other questions or comments that anyone would particularly like to put at this point? There was... To thank uh, Nikki and Chris Ben for coming along uh, again. Thank you so much. It was yeah. really interesting to hear about all this stuff. Great. Thanks so much. It's been great, great to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about the dropout halfway yeah. through. Okay. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank Thanks, you folks. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.